divorce court is a $50 billion industry for lawyers, experts, investigators, and other related contractors. A movie called Divorce Corp with a P explores the business of divorce and the pain it causes the participants. I think death would be easier than a divorce. It's very frustrating to have gone for help and then come out with your family destroyed. We have serious problems in our family law court system. Getting divorced is far from easy. Litigation lasted for over a year. I was married only four months, and my divorce has lasted over six and a half years. Close to eight years. Eight years. Why is divorce so difficult? People can get as much justice as they can afford. Most people cannot afford any justice at all. What's wrong with that? This is a business. The more you charge, the more people are willing to pay. They didn't give me a lawyer. Pay this $11,000 or go to jail. It really got to the end of the line for me. And I said to the litigants, I want you to know, after two hours, we will have spent more than most people in this courthouse make in a year. Your home, your, your valuables are all going to be sold to pay the lawyers and people like me. Even though I was acquitted, he still made a decision to take my son away from me. His birthday was last week, and I didn't get to see him. What you have is a tinderbox, and the lawyers are throwing gasoline on that fire. The system is designed to create conflict. I received a phone call for another 25000 He'd be able to give us what we wanted. Extortion? Family court results in more violence than any other area of law. Deaths, suicide, murder. No jury, just the one biased judge. The judge says, even if you win, you have to pay. The whole thing is just insane. Follow the money. I want to say that my personal experience with divorce court is that they're good, responsible people who work in the courts and care about others. And I know others who've had good experiences too. But that's not the point. I'm a lawyer and educated with a law degree. The legal system and its controls are not there to protect the strong. Laws should protect the weak from those who abuse power. With this in mind, let's take a look at divorce court. First, the cost. Marriage is a fairly simple process, at least in the legal sense, but divorce is nowhere near that simple. Can you talk about the business of divorce and why it's so complicated? To get divorced, you can't simply fill out a form that says, I'm divorced. You have to go to court, and a judge has to approve the divorce. And, you know, breaking up is traumatic on its own, never mind having to go to court and appear before a judge and trying to learn enough about the law if you can't afford to pay a lawyer uh, to do it properly. And if you can't afford to pay a lawyer, well, then they often take most of your money. It's the fourth most common cause of bankruptcy in the United States. It's not surprising that the average contested divorce in the U.S. costs $50,000. In the last 40 years, the number of divorce lawyers has exploded, increasing over 2,000% in California alone. And this is a nationwide issue. No matter what state you live in, you're going to get pulled in. In divorce, there's an unexpected foe. Not only do you fight your ex-spouse, who used to be the closest family member in the world, but you are in conflict with your own lawyer. Attorneys get paid by the hour. The more accusations they make towards the other side, the more things they ask you to send them, the more papers they file with the courthouse, the more they earn, and the more it costs you. Lawyers handle cases in a fairly similar fashion. They set an hourly rate, take a retainer, and then bill hourly against that retainer and then create bills from the hours that they spent later on. I only know, really, of one other firm in my area that does a flat fee. Everybody else is hourly. If a judge is late and you're sitting there for three hours, that client's getting billed for those three hours. I start to feel bad for them. I have to work 25 hours to pay for one hour of an attorney's time. 25 to one. And there are no limits. When attorneys get started, they have no incentive to stop until you run out of money. If your case is taking years and years, then that means some attorneys just putting in a lot of frivolous motions to delay the case. In the 60s, it take a few months, a year, now cases drag on five, six, seven, eight years. Which is extremely expensive, as you can imagine. You have lawyers who are in it for the money, 
who are greedy, who will milk a case. The attorneys definitely don't want to settle the cases because once they do, their income stream has been cut off. A lot of people go into debt as a result of their divorces. Some attorneys automatically put a lien on your house just to make sure that eventually they get paid. We took out an equity line of credit at my parents' house and that's been maxed out now. Uh, I think it's $250,000. What they do is bleed you until all the money is gone. Since flat fee divorces can be finished quicker and cheaper, why is it that only a handful of lawyers do them? This is not to say that every lawyer wants to hurt his or her client and bleed them dry. There's just an incentive for the lawyer to drag things on while the client wants things fast and painless. The director of Divorce Corp, Joe Sorge, takes issue with the legal fee system. A big topic that you spend a lot of time on in the documentary is these problems with the lawyers and these outrageous legal fees, but if people are willing to pay them, I mean, that's their choice. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. I think it's an oligopoly. You say, well, it's a free market. Lawyers can charge whatever they want to charge. However, um, they've made the, the law so complex that you pretty much have to hire these specialty lawyers that are divorce lawyers. There are only a certain number of them and that drives up the, their, their hourly rate. Solutions. Number one, cases should involve mediation rather than litigation. Two, laws should be simple like in Scandinavia where the cost there is a small fraction of what it is here. More about that later. Divorce court has two systems of support child support and spousal support. The child support system creates an asset and a financial incentive for the parties to litigate, which ultimately harms the children. When you get divorced, there are two types of support payments. One of them is called child support. Calculating child support is based not only on the difference in income, but also on who gets the most time with the kids. Are you gonna have your kid 86% of the time, like in a sole custody situation, or only 50% of the time, as in a shared custody situation. There's a lot of money at stake for, for both the high earner and the lesser earner. But let's say time goes by and you don't make as much money as you used to, or you want to spend more time with your kids. It's very difficult to get child support modified downward. And if you live in a major city, the wages are high, the cost of living is high, and the person who gets primary custody of the kids will realize, hey, I can move out of the city, my expenses will be far less, but I'll still keep getting that high child support amount based on the parent who's left behind in the major city. And time and again, very often, the parent who's left behind in the major city, they'll go to the court and say, hey, look, I love my child. I want to be with my child. I'm going to give up my good paying job in the city to go move to this small town so I can be with my child more. And all I want you to do, Your Honor, is just respect the fact that, of course, I can't make as much income living in this little town as I could living in Los Angeles or San Francisco or a major city. And the vast majority of the time, the judge will say, tough luck. Well, it's difficult to adjust to somebody who wants to, you know, who for years has maintained this level of earning based on the commitment of time, to now say, well, I'm going to diminish my hours so I can spend more time with this child. If he really and truly wanted to spend more time with the child, is very admirable. But is he taking a pay cut that makes this unrealistic? These people end up racking up a big child support debt. A lot of states have interest on the debt. Sometimes that interest is as high as 10 or 12%. And the person ends up saddled with a debt that they can no longer pay. People are being put in jail for not having the ability to pay their child support. The complaint against the support system is that you don't need support right now. Both parents share in the expense of raising the children. That's the current model uh, that most families have in raising the children. A second complaint is that the support calculations set the orders too high. This incentivizes litigation and has a burden on the paying spouse and an asset for the recipient spouse. The states set up the support system in this manner because they're incentivized to do so by Title IV of the Social Security Act. This dynamic is discussed by the head, by the executive director of Americans for Equal Shared Parenting. So tonight I'm going to try and go through a little bit of, of what Title IV-D is. Title IV-D was originally passed as a, a merit system. It's part of the welfare program. The reason was, years ago, the traditional family unit, 
the husband went out and worked and the woman stayed home. And I'm not saying that was right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way it was. Think back to Beaver Cleaver days. So if a couple had been married, say, 10, 15 years and got a divorce, it was very hard back in those days for a woman to be expected to make the same income if she'd been out of the workforce for 10 years. You can't be out of a workforce for 10 years and expect to make the same type of a salary. So they came up with child support, which would be an offset, if you will, to try and make sure that the child wouldn't maintain a semi-similar standard of living after divorce or separation. But I don't know if anybody remembers Ronald Reagan's famous quote, the most feared words in the English language are, we're from the government, we're here to help. Because anytime the government gets involved in something, you can plan on there's going to be problems. Anytime somebody starts a government program, it always starts out with a great intent. The challenge is, almost never does a government program start that just doesn't start growing and growing and just morphing all over the place. And once it's expanded, it's almost impossible to get it back to the original intent. And as a result, there's employees that are you know, making an income and have a, a job as a result of federal programs, and they're going to do everything they can to justify that job. And with Title IV, I'll explain in a minute, but the collection amounts have to increase you know, to be able to qualify for this incentive pool that we'll describe for those employees to be able to keep the job. It's sort of like I remember Bob McEwen used to always say, when robbing, Peter, when robbing Peter to pay Paul, you can always count on the loyal support of Paul. And that's basically what's been happening uh, to non-custodial parents all across the country. There's what's known as mission creep. And this is, as I said, any type of federal program starts out with a mission creep. It started off, as I said, basically for welfare programs, for the people who uh, needed federal assistance so that the government could get some of that. If they were helping, say, a, in, in the you know, olden days, it was the woman that needed some type of welfare support to be able to get back on her feet again after divorce or separation. And so the government was giving out TAMP, and in order to try and get that money back, they were going after the non-custodial parent to be able to recoup some of that welfare money. Unfortunately, uh, in 1988, everything totally changed. They extended child support orders to all child support orders going through this federal case registry. And basically overnight, 19 million citizens, regardless of whether they were behind or not on child support, got thrown into this massive federal pool, if you will, where the federal government pays all the administrative costs and when they pay administrative costs, they can dictate through mandates and incentives how they want things to go. And as a result, 83% of all of the cases that go through the Title IV formula now would never be eligible for welfare. Never. That's just unbelievable to think. A program that was designed for welfare to basically, you know, it's the last thing. If, if people have nothing else, no hope, the government was going to reach down and help give those people a leg up. Only 17% of those cases will they ever even remotely qualify for any kind of welfare program. 83% will never qualify for welfare. The reason is because of these incentive programs. Some of you may remember this past year in the state of Illinois, there was a video clip going around. We just couldn't believe it. When the one guy representing the Illinois Bar Association literally made the statement that if a 50-50 bill passed, the state would lose millions, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars in federal money. I want to show the clip to which Mark Ludwig refers. It's the head of a bar association in Illinois discussing or criticizing this shared parenting law because if it's enacted, it's going to cost the state millions of dollars in financial incentives that are given by the federal government. Uh, thank you to the chair and to all the representatives in attendance today. I am Michael Strauss. I'm a family law attorney in Lake and Cook County. I'm also vice president of A Safe Place and secretary of the Family Law Section Council of the Illinois State Fire Association. And I happen to also be the co-author of the Illinois State Fire's resolution against this bill. Um, the, currently, the state of Illinois gets federal funding and grants. Um, and individuals obviously get state aid. There's very real potential for this state to lose federal funding, and I'm talking millions, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars, um, as well as parents not being eligible for the state aid. This issue has not been addressed by those in favor of this law, and so potentially Illinois loses a lot of money, Family, poor families lose more money, 
and our state gets less money. You tell, what's in the best interest of the kid is not to worry about how much federal dollars we're going to get for food stamps in this country. There's a, there's already litigation on that issue, isn't there, when there was 50-50 for parents? There is, and I've, I've, in speaking with some of the judges in Cook County, they brought up that there's been ungodly amounts of litigation to ensure that the people kept their food stamps, because frankly, it's labor death. Without them, they have a big problem. So let's make sure that we keep our kids out there. Let's keep the fight on so that we can continue to get food stamps. I want my people all the food stamps. Yeah. What do you mean? That's ridiculous to even bring that up. And, uh, and it was just, it was like a mic drop moment because we all known that all along. It was just kind of neat to hear the opposition actually bring that up at a hearing for a bill. But there's two major parts to the Title IV program. But one part basically is a reimbursement of 66 cents on the dollar for every dollar the state spends in collection efforts. People have been saying that the state gets reimbursed for the dollars they collect. They do not get reimbursed for the dollars they collect. They get reimbursed for the money they spend on collection efforts. So for instance, if they hire, let's just for argument's sake, say they hire two people at $50,000 a year and their person's sole job is child support collections, then they would get, the state would get reimbursed $66,000 of that money. Now that in itself is just massive. Imagine if you owned a business and somebody else was going to pay 66 cents on the dollar for every employee you could hire. Can you imagine how many more employees you would hire? Now, there's not a business person around that wouldn't hire more employees if you had that kind of free money coming in. So that part creates a problem. The huge problem is created, though, by this incentive pool. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but the incentive pool, there's five parts to it that all the states could uh, compete for. About a half a billion dollars is lumped into this pool, and states compete against each other based on five factors. One of the factors is the percent of paternity establishments. The next thing is the child support order establishments. And that's the one that's really affecting the majority of people. Because the higher they can get those orders up, the more money the state is going to get based on that incentive pool. And then the current support orders, the arrears collections, and the cost effectiveness. But to be honest, there, there's really three of those that are the main things, and that's the child order establishments, the current support, and the arrears collections. Those three alone make up about 75 to 80% of the actual formula. And so that's why we're running into so much problem. They always say, follow the money. Uh, states are going to have a hard time passing a piece of legislation if they realize, okay, we're already getting this federal money. So if we stop getting this federal money, we're going to have to take that money out of our own personal budget, for the state or lay off all kinds of state employees. So state employees do everything they can to make sure that there's going to be obstacles to getting a 50-50 legislation passed. But more importantly, every one of those five factors is based on an increase over the previous year. So if you collected so much last year, you've got to increase that amount next year. So employees, in order to try and keep their job, are going to do everything they can to increase child support orders. Well, what's the easiest way to do it? If you have 50-50, most parents would basically take care of their own expenses. The true support is being taken care of. If the child is living with each parent 50-50, each parent takes care of their own expenses, the child is being supported by both parents. However, if instead, if you can get an 80-20 split, or a, like in Texas, or standard possession order, or whatever they have, where you get every other weekend and a little bit of time on Wednesday nights, now there's a drastic offset. Now there has to be money paid, uh, which basically qualifies for this Title IV D money. So remember, the problems and the criticisms in the support system is actually incentivized by Title IV of the Social Security Act by our federal government. The law is actually pitting parents against each other. The other factor that creates painful and unnecessary litigation is the fact that the support calculations are set too high. Joe Sorge interviews an, an economic expert to explain this dynamic. We believe that this University of California study reveals for the first time the true costs of raising children and uncovers damning evidence that our current child support calculations unnecessarily fuel custody battles. So we sat down with a brilliant economist, Dr. William Komenart, the main author of this study, 
He's professor of economics at the University of California and once served as the chief economist of the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. However they do it, they must pay attention to da available data on the economic cost of raising children. Can an economist determine what it costs to raise a child? Yes. Suppose you have two households with pretty much the same income levels and the same uh, general standards of living. And one of these households might have one child and another household might be childless. And then one can compare the, the household with a child with the household without the child and, le and try to examine with available data did the household with the child spend more on housing, more on food, more on clothing, more on child care and education, more on other different elements of expenditures. For the most part, your child lives in your household and you know, consumes the same collection of goods that you consume. Do people that have uh, their first child spend more on food? Generally, no. They spend the same amount on food despite the presence of the first child than they spend earlier. If you have another mouth eating, how can you possibly not spend more on food? You probably throw away less. Suppose it was true before the presence of children, you would eat out a lot. And we all know that food out in restaurants is expensive. And when the child arrives, you, have, you eat at home more. So there may be some redistribution within the categories. I don't doubt that. But your total outlays you know, don't appear to be that much different in the presence of a child than before. Dr. Komener's approach measures what is typically called marginal cost increases. For example, an automobile does not burn much more gasoline with two people sitting in it than it does with just one person sitting in it. The cost of the extra fuel consumed would be called the marginal cost of adding a second passenger. If we dig into the details of Dr. Komener's publication, we find that the increase in food expense is, in fact, very low when children are young. But as the children age, food costs go up significantly. This might lead one to believe that child support amounts should be increased as the children age. However, Dr. Komenor's data also reveal a counterbalancing trend. Parents spend less on childcare services as the children age. While these two factors do not offset each other exactly, and the results vary somewhat in different economic brackets, total marginal expenses do not change substantially as children get older. How many households did you study? We looked at over 16,000 households to do these comparisons. Your control group had no children? That is correct. And then the group that you were measuring the increase in expenditures had one, two, three, or more children? We did it in three different circumstances, with one child, with two children, and with three children. I asked Dr. Komenor if others had published on this topic before he and his co-authors did. He said yes, there are two other published methods, but neither looks at out-of-pocket marginal costs. The U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, annually publishes a report on the cost of raising children. And what's striking is that they use the same data that I use. We all use the same data. But he said that the USDA method is flawed because it simply takes certain expenditure categories and divides those costs by the number of individuals in the family, including the children. This is called the average costs method, as opposed to the out-of-pocket marginal costs method. I asked him to give us an example of why his method comes up with a more realistic measure of transportation costs than the USDA method. The household had two cars before the arrival of children, and now has two cars still. And for the most part, they, say they spend the same amount of money on cars and gasoline and all of that stuff. And the car has had a back seat before, which wasn't generally used. And now it's used with the child. So there's essentially no additional transportation costs. The real transportation cost is the cost of the car seat. He went on to explain that the USDA method is also flawed with respect to housing costs. They said that the, co the housing cost of the child is the cost of an additional bedroom. So if originally you had a two bedroom apartment, one used with a den, then the housing cost would be the hypothetical rental cost of a three bedroom 
apartment where you could keep your den even if that was never used. So again, that was a fiction. We then talked about a second competing method for studying the costs of raising children called the income equivalence or IE method. The IE method is used by a private consulting firm that advises many of the states regarding child support levels. The IE method assumes that fewer dollars are spent on adult food and adult clothing so that money could be made available for the needs of the children. The method then assumes that a similar shifting of expenses will occur in other cost categories as well, such as for transportation and housing costs. But the IE method does not measure those shifting expenses directly. Instead, it makes the questionable assumption that parents will give up the same proportion or percentage of their income in other expense categories as they did for adult food and clothing. So it multiplies that same percentage times the family's other expenses to compute a synthetic amount. It then assumes that a custodial parent would need this synthetic amount in order to raise children under a lifestyle that also affords that custodial parent all the things they enjoyed prior to having children. They're trying to assign a value to keeping the old lifestyle, even though you're living with a child and you don't follow the old lifestyle. You may it, not even want the and old And you lifestyle. may not even want, that's exactly right, you may not even want the old lifestyle, but that's not taken into account in these other methods. It's a, it's a bizarre approach, I believe. We all know that once you have a child, your whole life changes and you have focus on your children in a way that you never did before. But the methodology used in, these, in this IE method ignores that reality. Does the IE method measure the value to parents of having a child? No, it doesn't. I, I've, I've read that um, some of these IE methods actually measure the amount of tobacco and alcohol consumed by the, the adults. It, yes, they do. Isn't that bizarre? And yet that approach is the dominant approach today, used today, by which child support guideline amounts are determined. Why? <clears throat> the reason is because when the states got into this business back in the 1980s, there was no data on the child expenditures, there were data on household expenditures. And so they needed to find a way to go from available data for the household to that which it applies to the child. Did you look at single parents? Yes, I did. Because one could argue that the single parent with a child is the more relevant economic situation than the uh, married or the couple with or without children. That's, that's exactly right. The costs of raising a child or children in a single-headed household are slightly greater than the, on average than those uh, in a married household. You're basically saying that people spend less on children than these other methods estimate they spend on children. Yes substantially less and the reason is because our method is limited to out-of-pocket expenditures you know direct real money. money real money what the other methods do is attribute expenditures to children which are not made out of pocket it's a it's a fiction well, let's take a look at the costs estimated by the IE and USDA methods and compare them to the costs measured by Dr. Komenor's method. For married households, the IE method overestimated the cost of raising a child by about 200%, and the USDA method overestimated the cost by roughly 300%. The overestimates were even more extreme for single-parent households. While the IE method did not even look at single-parent households, the USDA method overestimated expenses by over 300% for low-income households and over 400% for mid- to high-income households. These overestimates have been misleading the states in setting child support awards that are too high, by somewhere between $400 and $800 per month per child. Over the course of a child's dependency, that could amount to nearly $100,000 per child of unsupported costs for low-income families and nearly $200,000 per child of unsupported costs for middle-income families. The payers recognize that the amount of money that is that they're obligated to pay exceeds the actual expenditures on the child. Child, they know that. They're not they they live it. And so it's so what the payers are are funding is not merely the cost of raising their children, but also uh, a financial asset 
which benefits the recipient. And of course, that creates discord between the parents. The payer objects and the recipient uh, feels entitled to it, which would not be true if the child support award amounts truly reflected the out-of-pocket costs of raising children. There's approximately 120 billion of unpaid child support. This data suggests there's not merely an unwillingness to pay support, but it's an inability to pay because the calculations have been set too high. The support payers know that there's a financial benefit. It creates litigation, resentment, and bitterness between spouses, and the people who ultimately pay the price are the children. The second form of support is spousal support. Even in a short marriage, alimony can go on for years after a marriage, even after the payor loses his job. When you get divorced, there are two types of support payments. One of them is called alimony. Alimony is supposed to balance the income between spouses after marriage, but many states have laws that make alimony last longer than the marriage, sometimes even for life. Your responsibility based on the law is to maintain your ex-spouse to the lifestyle of the marriage. The alimony law was based on a model of a woman stays home and takes care of the children and the man is the primary and sole breadwinner. It is going to be less and less relevant as time goes on because women are less and less likely to be solely housewives. We have people who are married for short-term marriages of four and five years who are paying 25 years worth of alimony. My wife, my present wife of 26 years, sends my ex-wife who divorced me 30-some years ago, sending her a check every day. The judge told me I have to work two jobs in order to keep him out of jail. Would you have married me if you knew this was going to happen? No, I wouldn't have married him. Family courts have become much more fearsome collection agencies. What you find is people living off credit cards. They're taking their food and their rent and their living expenses, and they're using those credit cards to finance those things racking up big debts in the wake of bankruptcy, trying to maintain this pre-divorce standard of living. No matter how much I tried to prove I couldn't afford $865 a week, it didn't matter. The judge will say, do you have the money? And you say no, and they cuff you, and shackle you, and take you right out to jail. How do you go through the courts being threatened to be put in jail? You've, you've not committed a crime. You've only had a failed marriage. Joe Swords, the director of Divorce Corp, speaks out against alimony. He recommends adopting the Scandinavian system discussed in the following clip. On that point, with alimony payments and child support, they cause a lot of the complications. So you think we should get rid of alimony, or where, what's your take on yeah. that? Yeah. So I personally believe that we should eliminate alimony from the statutes, but it should be subject to a private agreement. If it's only appropriate in less than 20% of households today, that shouldn't be something that's done routinely as part of a divorce. It should only be done if the couple has agreed that this is the kind of relationship we're going to have and therefore there should be alimony. We should look to um, other countries that do things where men and women are equal or treated equally or more equally. And yeah, so you point to Scandinavia. We looked at how they handle divorce there and they do have alimony, but only for six months. And once the divorce is finalized, then there's no alimony unless they've entered into a private agreement to provide for alimony. In law, divorce court is a court of equity, which eliminates the jury. This creates an apparent contradiction in that our United States Constitution guarantees our jury trial in financial disputes, but when we are fighting for our child or our home, we don't get one. Joe Sorge explains the policy of equity court. Talk about how family court is different from other types of court. Well, family courts are called courts of equity, not courts of law. And typically an equitable matter is something that can't be quantified in dollars. And so there's usually a non-dollar solution to an equitable issue. Marriage used to be a covenant for life. And if someone broke that covenant, uh, it was difficult to come up with a dollar amount that would satisfy that breaking of a covenant. And so, what happened is they would have a judge come up with, well, what is a fair solution to this situation where maybe both people were working, but maybe one person was not working and the other one was, how can we come up with something that works for both of those people? And if you have a really nice judge and uh, a friendly courtroom and very simple laws, um, that's not such a bad idea. 
But what we have today is 2,000 pages of family code, uh, ridiculously complex, uh, written half in Latin. Although there's a logical, well-intended policy for eliminating the jury, the unintended consequence is that it gives the judge enormous power with almost no accountability. When you go to divorce court, you'll find the judges can do whatever they want. There is no law in family court. There's only, there's only what the judge wants to do, period. All kinds of basic mechanisms that exist in the criminal and civil courts in this country don't exist in the family courts. In a family courtroom, the judge dominates the proceeding. In my world where there's no jury, you are the decision maker. I'm more comfortable with that. How much time do you have to devote? What do you say to each case? On a typical Monday or Tuesday, I would have a calendar of anywhere from 15 to 40 cases. The average case, in all fairness, is maybe five to ten minutes. The Court of Appeal in San Diego ruled that actually judges did not have to read the pleadings before they made their rulings. So now it's a local rule. If you want a judge to actually read the pleading, you've got to make a special request <laughs> beforehand. Not too many people know that. It's not for the father to decide. It's not for the mother to decide. It's for the judge to decide after the judge has weighed all the factors. All of us make decisions. You decided what color socks you were going to wear this morning, what you're going to have for lunch. But a judge makes decisions for other people. And you make a hundred of those a day. And if you make a bad one, you just make another one. My father was a lawyer who handled a general practice. And he occasionally would take me to court with him. When I was about 14 or 15, he had a case and the woman was on the stand and he's boring in on her and he's boring in on her. He says, and didn't you on July 5th have sexual relations with your husband? And she breaks down crying and sobbing. And I'm looking at this and I said, I got to get into this. This is great. All judges have the same middle name, God. And there, it's complicated because the judges have special relationships with a lot of these lawyers. And unlike other public officials, judges do not have a waiting period between public and private practice. A judge can retire one day, practice as an attorney the next day, and then go back to being a pro tem judge a day later. Judges will oftentimes try to get very cozy with the law firms that they want to work for at, upon retirement as a judge. And so it creates a conflict of interest. The other conflicts of interest is uh, lawyers are allowed to contribute to the election campaigns of judges, appear before them in court and yet give them money toward their election campaigns. And so I'm afraid what that does is it can allow certain law firms to buy influence with the judge. Or if it's not direct campaign contributions, it could be things like appointing the judge to some committee um, that's a prestigious committee or throw, throwing a fundraiser for the judge. And so there's the, no oversight or accountability? I wouldn't say there's no oversight. There are um, judicial review committees. But as we point out in the film, they rarely discipline a judge. It's extremely rare. Um, and those review committees are made up of judges and lawyers. When you combine hidden bias with unlimited power and lack of ac accountability, you have a system that can easily be abused. An effective way of limiting abuse is to strengthen the oversight of the State Judicial Conduct Board and tighten rules for conflict of interests. There's so much at stake in divorce. Custody of the children, division of assets, and support orders. To decide these complicated issues, parties don't even get a jury. They get a judge who often doesn't have enough time to hear all the facts. This dynamic creates an incentive to lie and create false allegations against the opposing party without any sanction or penalty for making up malicious accusations. Because there are so many incentives to lie in court during a divorce, people often make up false abuse charges. Physical violence and sexual assault are crimes, and our justice system is set up to handle criminal accusations like this. But family courts also listen to and act upon such accusations. And because false accusations are so common during a divorce, these cases are typically not turned over to criminal court. Family court judges have to distinguish between true abuse victims and those crying wolf for financial gain. One of the biggest problems in family court is there are so many false accusations and so few consequences for those accusations. 
How could you be married for 20 years? You were a great husband, she was a great wife. Now we're going through a divorce, he's a pervert, he's a drug dealer, he's doing all these horrible things. She's an alcoholic, she's a drug dealer, and she's sleeping with everybody. Did, did this just happen in the last week or two? I got a lot of those that happened right at the top of divorce action when both people were in the house and one person wanted to get the other person out of the house. It may be that, in fact, there is no violence, but they make it up because they've talked with their friends or they've gone to a lawyer who said, well, make it up and if you really do a good job, then you can get him kicked out. Now you are in the house. You have a big leg up in keeping the kids and maybe keeping possession of the house. I've counseled women and a few men on how to get the other side thrown out of the house. How hard is that to do? If you follow my instructions, easy. Domestic violence, first of all, is defined so broadly. There's so many things that can count as domestic violence that it's not hard. It's not hard to be accused of domestic violence. It's, it's really a travesty the way a system, the system that it was designed to, to protect women from domestic abuse, to protect children from abuse, to protect children from sexual abuse, a system that was set up with, with every good intention, that was set up to protect those who needed it, has been allowed to be subverted so that false accusers really are able to gain so much by making the false accusation. To make matters worse, a judge might have to make 25 to 40 important decisions on his list in one day, some which can affect the litigants for their entire lives. There has to be sanctions, penalties, or other deterrents for raising these harmful defamatory accusations. Such a deterrent would reduce abuse and protect the integrity of the system. We've been discussing the problems in the divorce system with support, and the power of judges, let's conclude with how we got here and solutions for reforming the system. The current divorce laws were written at a different time, 50 years ago. The family model was different then. Mothers took care of raising the children and fathers took care of most of the financial support. But now, 50 years later, the family dynamic is different. There's both shared parenting and a shared expense in the vast majority of family models. What we have today is 2,000 pages of family code, uh, ridiculously complex, uh, written half in Latin. So what is the average cost of divorce these days? So the average cost of a non-contested divorce would be between ten dollars and $20,000 typically. And for a contested divorce, it's $50,000 plus. And you know, there's some divorces that cost $20 million. You said there's 2,000 pages of this um, legislation regarding divorces. Uh, can you talk about when that came to be? The transition occurred primarily in the 1970s and 1980s. Prior to 1969, we had what was called the fault divorce system. You had to prove that your spouse did something wrong like adultery or abandonment or brutality uh, in order to get a divorce. In 1969, Governor Ronald Reagan in California signed the first no-fault divorce law in the United States, and most of the other states quickly followed, where you could file for divorce unilaterally, but you just couldn't get, you couldn't finish the process without a judge. And so um, what happened is that uh, because um, there was this big rush to get divorced, and, and frankly, primarily by women who were caught in bad marriages prior to no fault, um, they suddenly wanted to go through this process, but they found that the laws had been written to address the old patriarchal system where the man was the, the king of the castle. And so many of the uh, laws that pertain to the patriarchal system no longer pertain to the women's lib movement and women having independence. And so the legislatures under the um, lobbying from the National Organization of Women and other uh, groups uh, that advocated, I think, very favorable um, changes to the legislation, logical and, and, and good-spirited changes to the legislation, kept writing in all these new laws to put in these new protections. But as in many cases, the law of unintended consequences set in. And so a lot of these laws that were written in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were a good, good idea at the time, no longer necessary, and create much of the confusion and animosity that we see today in family court. Scandinavia has a more modern system 
that reflects the current reality of most families. Could you talk about how we could get the government out of divorce, if that's even a possibility? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think, again, I keep looking to Scandinavia. To get divorced in Scandinavia, you file a form with the government. And if you have children, then you have to wait six months for a possible reconciliation. If there's no reconciliation, then you're divorced. It seems to work there. They don't have to go to court. They don't have to ask for a judge's approval. They don't have to have lawyers reading the 2000 page code. They divide their assets much like we have our community property laws uh, will divide assets in the United States. So if they went into the marriage with separate property, they walk out with that separate property if it hasn't been commingled. But if they've invested together, if they've worked together, if they contributed to a joint account, if they bought a house together, then that's all split 50-50, right down the middle, simple split. And they go to an accountant to figure that out. You don't need a lawyer to figure that out. Lawyers are not as good at math as accountants are anyway. Until that happens, until the laws are modernized, there's another great solution that can reduce the expense of litigation and also reduce the randomness of this process. It's not well publicized and it's not well known. Mediation. When parties can't agree, they should go to a mediator who can work out a mutually agreeable solution at a fraction of the cost. Many Americans are completely unaware that there's an alternative to getting divorced in court. Don't let the court decided for you if they don't have to. When you go to court, what you have is a tinderbox, and virtually anything can ignite that tinderbox. And the lawyers, frankly, often are throwing gasoline on that fire. We're going to fight you. And even if you win, you will think you lost. If what people want is a durable solution, one that's not going to have them coming back to court every couple of years to modify the support arrangement or modify the parenting plan, then mediated or collaborative law solution is going to work much better for them. The goal is to move that case out of the courtroom, out of the place where gasoline is going to be thrown into that tinderbox, create a safe place for a difficult conversation. That's what mediation does. People like its control. They like the privacy. You can offer some creative solutions to maybe division of property that a judge can't do. People are much more likely to adhere to conclusions, decisions, agreements that they arrive at. And a collaborative law process or mediation process is really good practice for the negotiation they're going to have to do in the years ahead when they have the very challenging task of co-parenting. There are many people who can work out a parenting plan even though they have very different values and very different views of how to go through it. It gets parties started on a new way of working with each other, negotiating with each other. And doing well for their children and how well children can come out when their parents do not expose them to conflict. And that is virtually impossible in the litigation system. Although mediation and collaborative law have a huge success rate, the false promise of winning more money in court is often far too powerful to resist. In summary, divorce in the United States is inefficient, antiquated, and urgently needs reform. It costs so much that 80 to 90% of litigants can't afford an attorney, and the system itself is overburdened and can't give the parties the time to litigate issues so that the results are random and often unfair. To make matters worse, uh, the laws are incentivizing conflict because financial reimbursement are dependent upon unfair support orders. There's a better way. The law needs to be modernized to reflect the modern reality, which would, in turn, reduce the cost of litigation and the unfair results. When families separate and divorce, mediation is a perfect alternative to help reduce the expense and the randomness of the results. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please like the video, please like the page, the YouTube channel, and forward this link to someone who you know is going through a divorce. You might be able to sa uh, save them a lot of pain and money. Thanks for watching. Signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now.